Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I just wanted to take a moment to welcome everyone and um, talk a little bit about this program, which is co-sponsored by Mechanics Institute and the League of Women Voters of San Francisco, as well as our community partner, the JCC of San Francisco. My name is Kimberly Scarfano, and I'm the Executive Director of Mechanics Institute. As many of you know, this day commemorates the 72-year struggle of American suffragists and their supporters around the world. From the first convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, to the women who marched, protested, and were incarcerated, to the divisions and delegations that carried Black, Native American, and other diverse voices across the country, and those who fought to be included in the, mov the movement. And finally, to the ratification of the 19th Amendment and women's right to vote in the United States in 1920. The history of the suffrage movement is a complex, impassioned fight for women's equals ri equal rights. And now I'd like to turn this over to Laura Shepard, our events director at Mechanics Institute. Welcome everyone. Tonight's program, Women in Politics Today, a progress report, celebrates our own leaders and representatives. Tonight we will hear from Congresswoman Jackie Speer, California Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, Alameda County Supervisor Wilma Chan, Amy Allison, Founder and President of She the People, Marissa Lagos, KQED political correspondent, who is our moderator, and Allison Goh, President of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. We'll also be joined by historians, suffrage historians, Elaine Ellenson and Jennifer Helton, who will offer commentary in between our speakers, highlighting moments from the suffrage campaign that brought us to today. Our distinguished guests will offer perspectives from their engagement in public service, government, and social justice work. They will share their inspirations and aspirations and how women can lead our country and preserve democratic values from community organizing to legislating in Congress. Please note this event is a nonpartisan program. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Marissa Lagos. Marissa Lagos is a correspondent for KQED's California Politics and Government Desk and co-hosts a weekly show and podcast, Political Breakdown, with Scott Schaefer. At KQED, Lagos conducts reporting, analysis, and investigations into state, local, and national politics for radio, TV, and also online. Previously, she worked for the San Francisco Chronicle, covering San Francisco City Hall and state politics, and, as, and also at the San Francisco Examiner and Los Angeles Times. Marissa has won numerous awards for her work investigating the 2017 wildfires and her ongoing coverage of criminal justice issues in California. Please welcome Marissa Lagos. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. I really appreciate your introduction and having me here today for this amazing event, um, just jam packed with phenomenal women um, who I am lucky enough to know in my capacity as a journalist. Um, it's been interesting, I think, for me as somebody um, approaching 40, but still in my 30s, learning so much um, in these last months about the suffrage movement. I think like a lot of things, honestly, in American history, um, we're taking a new look at, you know, how they were framed as we were growing up and, and what we learned in school versus what we know by actually studying uh, history and, and sort of um, archival documents and footage. And I've been really heartened to see how nuanced the conversation has been, especially in you know my sphere in the media, around the issues about um, you know the racial sort of divisions um, within the movement, um, the the problems there, but also the fact that it is nuanced. That everybody is not sort of like you can't ever paint a historic event in with one brush. Um, and so it's been really exciting for me uh, to learn more, um, talk to some of our amazing panelists tonight uh, on other panels and really um, get a better sense of these things. 
And I'm gonna stop talking because um, our next, our first guest, uh, Jackie Spear, um, has a lot on her plate as well. Um, you are all familiar, I'm sure, with the Congresswoman who has had an illustrious career um, in Washington and in Bay Area politics. Congresswoman Jackie Spear currently represents California's 14th Congressional District. She serves on the House Armed Services Committee. She's chair of the Military Personnel Subcommittee, uh, also on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Committee on Oversight and reform, where she serves on the subcommittees on environment and government operations. Spears also co-chair of the Democratic Women's Caucus, the Congressional Armenian Caucus, close to my heart, uh, the Bipartisan Task Force to End Sexual Violence and the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. She's currently championing, championing the Equal Rights Amendment for final passage, which I'm sure she'll be talking about. I also just want to say, um, I was lucky enough to have the Congresswoman on my show last year when her book came out. And um, she is a phenomenal politician, but also just an amazing human. And I would really encourage oh. folks to go out and read it because I learned so much from you. Congresswoman, take it away. Oh, Marissa, thank you. Um, we are undaunted, and that's the uh, title of the book. Um, and we have to remain undaunted. So um, I, I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the Mechanics Institute for hosting this um, very special forum. And I see Wilma Chan, who I had the good fortune of serving in, in the state legislature with, and all of um, the other powerful women that will be joining us, and certainly looking forward to hearing the lieutenant governor as well. Um, let me just say that we celebrate today because in 1971, it was Bella Absent with those big hats that she used to wear. We can't even wear hats on the House floor anymore, so I don't know how she got away with it. But in any case, she actually authored the resolution to create Women's Equality Day on today, which was the first day that women got the right to vote 100 years ago. And I just want to read one phrase of the resolution. The women of the United States have been treated as second-class citizens and have not been entitled to the full rights and privileges, public or private, legal or institutional, which are available to male citizens of the United States. Little um, strong, but you know what? You could say that today because in so many respects, women are still um, second-class citizens. And as Marissa said, African-American women didn't even get the right to vote until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. And we are still working through so many of the restrictions and suppressions of the vote even today. Um, I was asked to speak a little bit about how I all got started in this great business called politics. Uh, I was 16 when I worked on my very first political campaign. It was for then Assemblyman Leo Ryan. And I was young and impressed by what could be done. But I must tell you, I never thought I had what it took to run for office or get elected to office. So for all of you who doubt that maybe you don't have what it takes, believe me, I was thinking the same thing way back when. And um, I was able to overcome those fears or reluctance and, and eventually to run for office. In fact, I like telling people that this is what a three-time loser looks like because I lost for student body president in high school. Uh, I lost the first time I ran for Congress after Congressman Ryan was assassinated and I ran for his seat and lost. And I ran for Lieutenant Governor in 2006 and lost. And it took another 10 years before we finally got our first woman Lieutenant Governor who you will be hearing from uh, in a short while. So uh, lots of reasons to celebrate because now we have our very first vice presidential candidate, soon to be our vice president, I hope. Um, and I'm not trying to spin anything here, but um, our first woman as a vice presidential uh, candidate uh, since Geraldine Ferraro, but a first woman of color and um, someone who is unapologetically fierce. What we do know is that women make a huge difference in elections. Um, it shifted the House of Representatives in 2018, uh, and we hope that it has a powerful impact this year as well. I just want to take us back in time to um, 1871, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony sent a letter to Congress saying, please, we implore you, give us the right to vote. I have a framed copy from the archives of that document in my office. And right next to it, a letter 
uh, dated November 2017, excuse me, 1917, by the National Association opposed to women's suffrage. And it was a list of women who were opposed to women getting the right to vote. And they said things in the letter like, if we give women the right to vote, it will create a national policy to make nagging um, something that is appropriate in this country. Um, at the time, there were so many that um, wanted to make sure that women didn't get the right to vote. The very first picket of the White House was done by women in November of 1917 in their white dresses. And on November 14, 1917, uh, the Night of Terror, as it's referred to, uh, there were 33 women that were arrested, beaten. Uh, one was actually stabbed uh, between her eyes with um, scissors, and they were um, put in jail, put in jail because they wanted the right to vote. Um, they were fed rotten food. Some of them went on hunger strikes. Some of them then got force fed. And uh, it was, in fact, um, a night of terror that has been forgotten, but we all need to recognize that we still have a lot of work to do. And I hope that as we um, celebrate today, we recognize that we are still not in the Constitution of the United States. The Equal Rights Amendment has not been approved to be put in the Constitution yet. 156 countries around the world have an Equal Rights Amendment in their Constitution, and the United States does not. Now in 1972, when it was first actually passed by the House and the Senate, uh, in a paternalistic manner, it was um, it included in the preamble a deadline by which it had to be passed. And as that deadline uh, became uh, close, they then struck the deadline and increased the number of years. So my legislation actually strikes the deadline completely. We now have 38 states that have passed the Equal Rights Amendment, um, the most recent being Virginia earlier this year. We passed the resolution in the House, H.J. Res. 79, it's sitting over in the Senate. So um, we have to get that passed. And the reason why we have to get it passed is until it's in the Constitution, uh, not only do women have to establish in court that they have been discriminated against, they have to prove uh, that it was intentional. It is not considered a suspect category like races, for instance, or religion. So um, I'm very optimistic that given the right mix in the Senate next year, we would be in a position to pass that. Um, I want to just close by um, talking about uh, a couple of issues that are, are still unaddressed. That includes childcare. If we've learned nothing in this pandemic, it is that there is no economic recovery until we have universal childcare. We can't continue to pay childcare providers $11 an hour and expect them to be able to live in any manner um, that is appropriate. And um, we have to do much more to make sure that we address the wage gap, which continues to um, especially uh, um, encumber uh, women of color. While white women make 80 cents for every dollar earned by a man, an African-American woman will make 64 cents and a Latina will make uh, 56 cents. So uh, we still have a lot of work ahead of us, uh, but we're up for it. And I think we just have to recognize that we can never say no. We can never take no as an answer and we have to uh, pursue it under uh, every imaginable aspect. Let me end by telling you this um, last story. Um, it's a story about who was the first woman who actually voted in California. Uh, I have to tell you a story about Charlie Parkhurst, who um, was a, a stagecoach driver, um, was called One-Eyed Charlie, uh, was well received um, throughout um, the California uh, region. And um, when he died, uh, well, before he died, he voted in 1868. But when he died, we found out that Charlie was not really Charlie, he was Charlotte Parkhurst. And he became the first woman to vote 
in the United States in 1868. He's now buried in Pioneer Cemetery in Salinas. Um, and we uh, are reminded that if you have to dress differently in order to vote, um, that's exactly what Charlotte did. Um, we don't have to dress differently. We just have to make sure that uh, we get the ERA, that we get so many of the other issues we want to address uh, in the Congress of the United States and in state legislatures across the country. Thank you so much, Representative Speer. It's really an honor to be on this panel with you. Um, and thank you so much for your leadership in bringing back the Equal Rights Amendment. It really shows that California women are leading the way. And actually, that's been true for a long time. What many people might not realize is that California women actually fought for and won the right to vote in 1911. Um, almost a decade before the 19th Amendment was passed. And you raised so much about the opposition. Um, there was a lot of opposition then as well. Uh, there was, for example, a resolution in the state legislature in 1893 that California women would have the right to vote for, uh, not for the main offices, but for boards of education and educational positions. Mm -hmm. It actually passed the legislature but the governor vetoed it. And the reason he gave was that because in the privacy of the voting booth, it was too much of a risk. California women might actually vote the whole ticket. And again, when California women went to lobby the legislature in 1896, uh, they were uh, told that they should go back home and look after their daughters because their daughters might be walking the streets. So it was due to some very strong women uh, who challenged uh, the uh, fact that women couldn't vote. And in fact, it what took a turn of um, uh, activism after the earthquake, when women sort of came out of the parlors, the sort of elite women who were running the suffrage uh, clubs at the time and into the streets. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit later about some of those women who took the campaign um, into the streets, uh, had sit-ins in San Francisco City Hall, had sit-ins in the San Francisco Chronicle offices when they ran lies about what suffrage would bring. And we're so glad that you're carrying on this tradition uh, for us today. Thank you, Elaine. Um, really appreciate your thoughts. We'll hear from her again in a bit. Um, I am next very excited to introduce Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis. She is the first woman ever elected to this position, if you can believe that. Um, she was sworn in as the 50th Lieutenant Governor uh, by Governor Gavin Newsom in 2019. Uh, prior to that, from 2010 to 2013, Kunalakis served as President Barack Obama's ambassador to the Republic of Hungary. And her memoir, Madam Ambassador, Three Years of Diplomacy, Dinner Parties, and Democracy in Budapest, chronicles the onset of Hungary's democratic backsliding, which we continue to witness. Um, Governor Jerry Brown appointed Kunalakis to the chair of the California Advisory Council for International Trade and Investment in 2014. And she's also currently a director of the Association of American Ambassadors and a National Democratic Institute Ambassadors Circle Advisor. Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for joining us today and for all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Marissa. It's great to see you. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, I love the Mechanics Institute. Uh, I wish we could all be in that beautiful building together, but this is certainly the next best thing. And thank you all for putting together uh, the opportunity for us to celebrate today and celebrate women and all of the achievements and how far we've come. Uh, if I could just note, I caught the very end of Congresswoman Spears' comments. Uh, I, I, I hope she told her personal story or parts of it, or you can read it in her book, uh, but she really is a Shiro, an extraordinarily brave person uh, with the uh, commitment to public service that literally uh, she um, I would not let uh, anything stop her. In fact, uh, the more challenges that came her way, the more inspired she was uh, to get out there and lead. Uh, and she's just a Shiro, a hero of mine. Um, so I think that, Marissa, you wanted us to kind of talk a little bit about our personal stories. 
uh, tell our personal stories, how we got to where we are. And my story always starts with my grandmother in Greece. Her name was Katarina. She passed away about a year before I was born. Uh, she was born and raised in a village in Greece. She never left uh, the village where she was born and raised or the village uh, where she married my grandfather and lived for her whole uh, life. Uh, she never learned how to read. She never learned how to read or write or even sign her name. But she was really smart and really fierce and really well respected and kept her family uh, safe during the terrible years of the Second World War and the Civil War in Greece that, that followed. She also was the one who had this belief in the United States of America and uh, advocated for my 14-year-old father who insisted that he wanted to go to America where he had uh, two uncles, one in Chicago and one in Lodi, California. And so he left home alone no money, no English, came to the United States by himself, uh, traveled uh, first to Chicago and then uh, to live in Lodi. And he worked in the fields as a farm worker. Uh, and he often tells the story, not of one as hardship, but one as uh, incredible opportunity. He, he often would say that he felt he had landed in paradise living in uh, California. Uh, the road forward for him was wide open, and he ended up uh, taking advantage of California's extraordinary institutions of public higher education, came to Sacramento, uh, and went to Sacramento State University. I grew up in a very, very vibrant Greek American community, and there's no question uh, that the models for me were very much, um, you know, to pick a husband from the church and uh, be a homemaker. And, and that's, my mother was uh, uh, started out, she had a teaching credential, but uh, only taught for a short period of time before she started having her four kids. Um, and uh, that was all great and I loved to cook and my mother taught me how to sew. But in school, uh, I got a very different message from my teachers about what uh, opportunities might be available to me. And I learned about um, extraordinary women leading the way. And even though I couldn't have crystallized it at the time or really know where my life was going to take me, I was excited about the models uh, who I had an opportunity to meet. So growing up in Sacramento, I uh, came and I worked in this building where I am right now, my senior year of high school for a Greek American state senator, uh, 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 Nick Petras. And uh, then after high school, um, I went to Washington. I worked for uh, Bob Matsui the summer after uh, my senior year of high school. I uh, went to college. Uh, ha I've always been interested and fascinated with international affairs. I went and lived in Greece for a while, um, came back, went to business school. But all along the way, I've always been interested, not just in government, not just in politics, but in democracy, and in particular, what it was about our system that would allow people like us, who in any other place in the world couldn't possibly uh, rise up the way that we did, what is it about this system that allowed for these pathways, this pathway of the American dream, the pathway of the California dream? And I got a clue once um, talking to my father about uh, Cesar Chavez, and he was telling me how Cesar Chavez was his hero, because when he heard farm workers, other workers, talking about how uh, they were going to pressure them to give them better conditions in the field, he said, I thought, well, that's crazy. Why would they do that? Why? How could these farm workers' leaders possibly get them to do that? And what he realized when, with the success of the farm worker movement is that the way our democracy works is that if you organize, if you get people together and if you advocate around an issue, that issue can become the law of the land. And that lesson is something that really fundamentally was 
passed down to me that I've always been intrigued by and interested with, but that I also felt that as the daughter of an immigrant, that it was partially my responsibility to make sure that the system continued to work into the future. So, um, so uh, there's so much you know, that, that I could talk about, but I really do wanna focus on a couple of experiences that I've had as a woman. So I worked with my father for 18 years with one foot in political activism and the other in housing. And uh, I, I worked mostly uh, with men and, and I never felt that being a woman held me back at all. They were, everybody was very nice to me. I worked really hard, I was friendly. Uh, and what I realized is that, you know, our predecessors had broken a lot of those glass ceilings. Uh, I was probably protected because my boss was my father. So probably none of his employees were going to mistreat me or make me feel less than uh, because of my gender. But, um, but it was only when I started getting to the higher levels that I started to see all the ways uh, that women help each other and need to help each other in all the ways uh, that, that people can be held back. And so in terms of the ways that women help each other, I will tell you that uh, Nancy Pelosi has been my biggest champion. Uh, I thought I might run for Congress from Sacramento one day and she was teaching me and grooming me and mentoring me. Uh, I ended up going uh, overseas to serve as a U.S. ambassador. She was the one who championed me and promoted me and recommended me and helped me with things like, um, you know, framing my bio to fit in a press release and make sense. I mean, just very, very much a mentor to me uh, in things that you, I would take for granted now, but at the time I just didn't know. And then when it came to my confirmation hearing, they told us you should have uh, one person introduce you, your home senator or a Congress member, maybe two, but not more than that. Well, um, I, asked, uh, I asked Diane Feinstein to say a few words. And I asked um, uh, my friend Olympia Snow, Greek American Republican. And I thought, well, that'll be a nice balance. Well, on the morning of the uh, of the of my uh, confirmation hearing, uh, there was a message sent from the Congress that the Speaker of the House would be coming over to the Senate to listen in on a Senate hearing. Protocol-wise, this is highly unusual and requires a, a protocol process for her even to be able to do it. And she wanted to come and watch the hearing. Uh, at, uh, uh, as it started to progress, Barbara Boxer said, well, wait a second, I'm, I'm on this committee. I'm going to introduce Eleni. So then she said, well, Nancy, you're here. Surely you want to say a few things. So I'd been told to have one person, maybe two, introduce, you know, to be within the protocol. And, and we, four extraordinary, powerful women three senators and uh, the Speaker of the House all spoke for me. And the thing is, is that I thought it was too much. It's just, they knew that even though I was having my confirmation hearing, this was not over. And my nomination could easily get tubed or delayed or held up. And they wanted to make sure that when a woman is standing at a precipice of success, that they were going to make sure to push her over. And it was an enormously important lesson to me, not to take things for granted, but also to take every opportunity that I could to root out areas of discrimination and do something. So I'll give one story uh, of uh, one way, one of the early ways that I found that I could make a difference. So we had, and Marissa, give me a, a note if, if uh, we're getting to the end, and maybe I'll just finish with this. Uh, we uh, had a, um, uh, an opening in our embassy for a, um, a person to do a community outreach, a communications lead. And um, my deputy, uh, as was typical, brought me three names. 
And we talked about them and I said, well, who's the first guy, your first choice? Oh, he's a rock star. We don't even know why he could go anywhere. And he put Budapest and this is really exciting. So obviously we wanna put him first. Okay, second person. Oh yeah, I know he seems like a good guy, pretty competent, people like him, good interviews. Okay, who's the third on your list in priority? Oh yeah, you know, she, well, uh, she's just didn't have a great interview uh, she said she had the flu but uh, but it just wasn't a great interview and then one person didn't send in the recommendation which is a sign maybe they're not you know great and i said wait a minute she had the flu yeah and i said well what is, what are, are you sure maybe it was just a bad interview well, maybe. And I said, and tell me, tell me a little more about her. And she said, well, actually, she served in Budapest when she was a junior officer and she speaks Hungarian. The most important qualification for a communications person was language skills. So I said, why don't you go back and call her and do another interview? See if, you know, see how it goes when she's feeling better. A couple of days later, he comes back and he says, you're not going to believe this. I had this interview and it went great. She was terrific. I think we should put her as the first uh, person. And you know, she speaks Hungarian. So um, we did and she came and she was terrific. But what I realized is that there are a lot of different small subtle ways when you again, get to these uh, levels where women really have been over the last generation since we've had so much progress uh, in women's equality, where they're still held back, and sometimes it's in very subtle ways. So um, I won't tell the story, uh, but I will say that I was very proud to be part of a group of people, including a lot of women, who felt that our recommended nominee for vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris, was not getting well represented uh, by the media and that people who had other interests were supporting other candidates were saying things and doing things that was undermining uh, what we knew of her which is that she is the best partner and friend that anybody can have when it comes to solving problems and working in government and so a group of us got together and we stood up and we asked for a meeting uh, with the vp selection committee and uh, it was the honor, an honor for me to organize it because I'm an organizer, um, but to be part of a series of testimonies that I think it's safe to say didn't just impress them, but really blew the committee out of the water to hear from so many Californians who know Kamala Harris personally and stood up to go to bat for her. So uh, Marissa, I hope that's what you were looking for. Plenty of stories. I'm just so grateful to you to invite me here, but more importantly, to be bringing people together uh, to share stories, uh, to recognize how far we have come since our pioneering mothers uh, broke through those glass ceilings and got us the right to vote, uh, but still how much more we have to do and how much we can accomplish when women uh, root out those areas of sexism and help each other uh, to address them and, and get the kind of recognition uh, for work and leadership uh, that we deserve. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Jennifer? Yes, I'm here. Go for it. Hello, um, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, thank you so much for that. Um, it's really an honor to be on the panel with you and with so many other distinguished women. Um, I really appreciated um, hearing about um, your family's immigration experience. And I thought today as we celebrate the 19th Amendment, I would highlight a couple of women who were immigrants who were important in the passage of, the, um, of suffrage here in the United States. Um, the US has always benefited from the energy and the ideas of women who have immigrated here and the women's suffrage movement is certainly part of that. Um, one woman that I would like to recognize in particular was a woman who immigrated from Poland in, uh, she 
came in 1836 to New York and her name was Ernestine Rose. She was a Jewish woman and she left home because she had been uh, supposed to marry somebody and she didn't want to marry him. So she left, went to Berlin, London, and then came to the US where she really became one of the founding mothers of American feminism. Um, she, it's her activism which sort of successfully led to the passage of the one of the first feminist laws in US history, which was the 1848 uh, Married Women's Property Act in New York State. And the tactics and the methods that she used to get that law through the legislature really provided inspiration for two activists whom she mentored, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So in a way, she is a real pioneer of the suffrage movement. And I thought it would be good to recognize some of her contributions today. Um, Rose was eventually um, able to become a citizen of the United States, but uh, many immigrant women in the 19th and early 20th centuries could not become uh, citizens. Um, one woman for whom this was true was another immigrant who was important in the suffrage movement, Mabel Pinghua Lee, who immigrated to the United States in 1900 from China. Um, and though she could not become a citizen, she was very passionate about the issue of suffrage. And when she was an undergraduate at Barnard College, she spoke, she organized, she organized suffrage parades, um, she wrote editorials publicizing the suffrage cause, and um, organizations and grassroots efforts such as hers were instrumental in getting New York State to pass um, a state suffrage law in 1917. And that was really, that the passage of that law was a major impetus for the passage of the 19th Amendment at the federal level. Um, so uh, Mabel Lee later on be, went on to become the first woman to um, graduate from Columbia with a PhD in economics. And though she lived the rest of her life in the United States, we still do not know um, whether or not she ever became a citizen and voted. In 1952, the law that had prevented her from becoming a citizen was finally repealed. But I thought it would be nice to highlight the efforts of immigrant women um, in the passage of the 19th Amendment. Thanks, Marissa. Thanks, Jennifer. That's super interesting. Um, I'm excited also for our next speaker, Supervisor Wilma Chan. She is an Alameda County Supervisor who represents District 3, including the cities of Alameda, San Leandro, parts of Oakland, including Chinatown, Jack London, Fruitvale, and the San Antonio neighborhoods, and the unincorporated communities of San Lorenzo and Haywood Acres. Very, that's a supervisor job. You've got everything. <laughs> She's currently chair of the Health Committee and all in a multi-stakeholder initiative to end poverty in Alameda County. From 2000 to 2006, Supervisor Chan served in the California State Assembly, where she became the first woman and first Asian American to be a majority leader. Prior to that, she served four years on the Oakland Board of Education and then became the first Asian American elected to the Alameda County Board of Supervisors in 1994. Supervisor Chan, we're so happy that you're here and really appreciate um, your time. Uh, Ms. Chan, you need to unmute yes. yourself. Just getting used to this forum. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to the Mechanics Institute and the League of Women Voters for allowing me to speak on this great, uh, powerful panel of women. Um, I particularly want to call out Congresswoman Jackie Speer um, because she was a great mentor to me when um, I first entered the state assembly. And that woman is absolutely fearless. Um, she'll take on anything. Um, I just wanted to, I'm going to talk a little bit about social justice, but um, First, let me say that um, I'm from an immigrant family. I'm a second generation uh, Chinese American immigrant. And um, my grandfather was very disappointed when I was born because I have an older sister. And uh, he was very, very disappointed that my mom had another girl. Um, he was waiting for that grandson. Um, my dad was the oldest um, child in the family. And so he sent a Chinese name over. He did that for all the grandchildren. And my Chinese name meant change. And what he meant was he wished that I would change to be a, 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 a boy baby. Of course, that wasn't possible. So I, I knew this story from when I was little. And I think maybe that's why I decided to work for social change for my entire life. Um, I've been active for a long time from my days at Wellesley College when Hillary Clinton was also on campus through um, many years of volunteerism and um, public office. And I've just been 
very fortunate to work with some wonderful women. We should never forget that the right to vote was a very hard fought battle. It wasn't something that was given to women. Just like everything else that we value, we usually had to fight for. And um, so we have to continue the fight. I found this quote today that I really liked, and it was from Dan Nanny Burroughs um, from 1910, and she was an African-American um, suffragette. And she said, at their best, suffragettes set the bar high. They were charged with using their power to secure human rights for all. And I think that runs in the blood of a lot of women. Social justice runs in the vein of women leaders. And a lot of times women leaders, from my experience, are very concerned about social issues and what they can get done much more than what position they hold. Um, and I think that that's a great attribute and something that really adds to democracy and to social change um, in this country, particularly at this time. I um, wanted to sit, talk about um, a few issues uh, related to social justice that are going on right now. Um, first of all, in 2016, we passed an amazing housing bond in Alameda County, $580 million for low-income housing, which has provided housing for homeless, veterans, um, and other low-income people. This um, campaign, which um, I began, was also led by a steering committee of almost all women, including Gloria Bruce um, from the... Um, from the housing, uh, she's executive director of East Bay Housing Organization, Amy uh, Fishman from NPH Housing. And we were relentless in terms of the campaign. The two main organizers of the campaign were women. Uh, we went door to door, we made phone calls, and it passed by over 70% um, of the vote. And it's really provided a lot of housing for people who otherwise would have had no opportunity to have housing. Another really important campaign we did a couple years ago was to, prov to, to provide childcare for more women in Alameda County. Um, it would almost make Alameda County a universal childcare county. And also um, to pay workers who are mainly women $15 an hour. As you know, childcare workers, uh, many of them only make about $10 an hour. This campaign was very grassroots. It was led by parents, um, by a group called Parent Voices, by childcare workers, and most of the campaign team, again, was women. Now, we weren't quite able to get the two-thirds vote, but since it was a community-led initiative, we're still waiting for a court decision that may allow us to pass this on a 50% plus one. And we're very hopeful this will happen as it goes forward through the appellate court and to the uh, California Supreme Court. This is an extremely important issue, as um, Congresswoman Speer um, noted in, in her remarks, and um, this was led by women. During the COVID crisis right now, we have very, very strong women leadership at the county. Our county administrator is an Asian woman. Our healthcare director is an uh, Indian and Japanese uh, American woman. Our social service director is an African American woman. And our public health director was the Chinese American woman who was so good that Governor Newsom recruited her away to Sacramento. And now she's the acting director of public health there. Um, we have tremendous leadership in the county on dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. Asian Health Services, La Clinica de la Raza, have led in us developing a community-based model that isn't just um, talking to people, but actually working with the community because we found that there are many different reasons why people don't get tested, why they're not able to isolate at home. And we've come out with some um, groundbreaking initiatives based on community feedback. For instance, giving people who need to isolate at home a $1,250 uh, $1, check so that they can stay home and have money coming in to pay for food or rent or whatever it is, their utilities, because people were going to work when they were sick because they had no way to stay at home. We also are doing food delivery and um, providing people with all the services they need in order to isolate and to clamp down on the quarantine. Um, this particularly affects 
Latin, Latinx and Black families. And the Latinx community, our COVID rate is at about 30% of those tested. And there are many, many barriers to these mainly immigrant families to being able to uh, receive aid, to get better, and to prevent the spread throughout their community. Um, there, is, there are so many other stories that I can tell you. Um, social justice, as I said, is, is just on the minds of women. And we still have a long way to go. Um, today, I'm the only woman on the Alameda County Board of Supervisors with five men. And um, I definitely uh, will say, uh, with all due respect to my male colleagues, that our office is the go-to office when you need to get something done. Um, so today I celebrate the 100th anniversary of the uh, right to vote with all of you. The right to vote was, was an indication that women are smart, women have the right to vote, women are political, women have a voice. And in fact, in California today, today in Alameda County, and I believe in the nation, women are the majority of registered voters. So we have a great deal to do in terms of determining the future of this country. And we have a lot of very intelligent young women coming up. Um, I have a lot of young women who I work with in the office, who I mentor. And our future is going to depend very strongly on these young women learning the leadership skills and coming forward um, to be our future leaders. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Supervisor Chan. And um, you have such uh demonstrated such leadership in social justice issues. And actually, I want to share with our listeners that your district actually was the home of the first woman-led suffrage march. In 1908, women led a march um, in Oakland, uh, 300 women. They were marching on the Republican Party conference uh, demanding that there be a suffrage plank in the party platform. Uh, the Republican Party did not adopt that plank at that time, but it certainly drew a lot of attention. And the women that were part of the suffrage movement really grew out of different kinds of social justice movements as well. So for example, um, in the African American community, there was a very strong uh, suffrage uh, campaign in the black churches and in the black clubs and African-American men were the strongest supporters among men for women's suffrage. Uh, the, uh, tai Leung was a Chinese American um, suffrage activist who had been act, who had been instrumental in fighting trafficking of Chinese women um, who had been brought to the United States, forcibly brought sometimes, and sold literally on barracoons on the port of San Francisco. And she helped to rescue those women and then went on to become an activist for uh, suffrage leadership. And again, this was at the time of the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, but she uh, spoke to Chinese men who had been born here and were allowed to vote. Another um, wonderful suffragist that I'm very fond of is Selena Solomons. She was um, very skeptical of the society-led suffrage movement. So what she did was rent out a hall near San Francisco's Union Square on Sutter Street, and she opened the Votes for Women Club. And there she cooked and she served lunch to the working girls, the waitresses, the shop girls, the laundresses, the telephone operators. And she invited them to come for lunch and then she organized them to walk precincts and uh, join in the campaign for the women's suffrage movement. Um, she was the one who actually led um, a sit-in of um, working class women in the um, San Francisco City Hall. And then after suffrage was won here in 1911, many of the women went on to become involved in other social justice movements, in the labor movement, um, in the reproductive rights movement, in the LGBT movement. And so we can see that suffrage is part of a long history of fighting for women's rights in this country, which thank you, Supervisor Chen are very much a part of. Thank you.
Thank you, Elaine. I'm also very excited to introduce our next guest. Amy Allison is the founder and president of She the People. They're a national network of women of color. She's hosted the nation's first presidential forum for women of color in 2019 and leads national efforts to build inclusive multiracial coalitions led by women of color. She has appeared in numerous media outlets, including KQED, um, <laughs> Politico, The New York Times, and PBS. And um, Amy, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Marissa. Good to see you. I think um, I, when I was asked about celebrating 100 years, I thought about um, you know, who, who I am. I, as a biracial Black woman, am a beneficiary of generations of Black women who fought for um, our full citizenship rights and, and the right to vote. And for women of color, including Latina and Asian American and uh, Muslim and indigenous women, um, uh, gender at, is, is not, uh, cannot be separated from race. And from a hundred years ago in the activism led by black suffragettes like uh, Ida B. Wells um, and Sojourner Truth, even the first woman, the first American woman to talk about uh, women's right to vote and politics in, in front of a crowd of men and women of both genders was a black woman named Maria Stewart. So from the very beginning, back in 1832, we have uh, black women and other women of color who have built up uh, a, a movement and contributed to a movement. A hundred years ago, though, white women uh, benefited from uh, the, that, that movement. And um, I think like many institutions and movements in uh, American life, it was infected uh, by racism that led for, uh, you know, the Susan B. Anthony's to tell uh, black activists and other women of color to go to the back of the march who actively um, argued against uh, the, you know, the, the full citizenship um, in the 15th Amendment that, uh, that, that had um, language that excluded uh, the humanity and, and uh, the civil rights of uh, black and brown women. And that led to a very, very long schism amongst women of different races that continues even till today. And it's important to say that and to say that, uh, you know, this country owes a great debt to suffragettes of color, to activists of color, to, to the black and brown women who didn't give up after the 19th Amendment only guaranteed access to the ballot box for white women, and they continued to fight. But the fight never was simply on gender. It was a fight for uh, racial justice and for economic justice, um, very deeply um, rooted in um, struggles for racial equality that ended um, you know, and guaranteed uh, the access to the ballot box uh, when the Voting Rights Act was signed. I think when I, when I think about my own um, organizing and activism in the wake of the 2016 election, you know, for a, a lot of people um, who had this idea that there was a women's movement that was crafted and shaped by the suffragette movement, um, didn't fully understand the racial dynamics and didn't understand that even today, even 2020, race is more of a determinant for how people vote than gender. And there is a schism um, and a divide uh, between um, how the majority of white women as, as political actors, the, the role they, that uh, they play nationally and, and women of color. It's not everybody. It's not an essentialist argument, but it is, it is political fact. It is also true that women of color are uh, a, the majority of voters, uh, majority of women voters in our state of California uh, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Texas, Florida, many of the states that are now going to determine uh, who wins the White House and, and who wins the majority of the Senate and who wins down ballot. So um, when we look at the importance of uh, the activism that grounded the initial, initial expanding the franchise all the way till today, we see women of color being um, so central and key 
to expanding the right to vote for everyone. Um, I have been uh, organizing in California, but across the country in 2020 is really around uh, states in the South and Southwest um, where women of color are a quarter of the electorate or more. Um, and what we're finding in a lot of states is that voter suppression is uh, undoing the work of the suffragettes, the women of color that worked so hard 100 years ago, 50 years ago, to secure and expand the right to vote. It's undoing that work. It's like death by a thousand cuts. If we look at what's happening in, uh, we look at uh, Georgia, the primary this year, where um, voter, uh, you know, uh, uh, voting machines were moved and voting locations uh, eliminated. We look at Kentucky's election where um, in the main area of the state where most black voters and the majority of black voters being black women uh, would go to cast their vote, it was all consolidated to one um, location that closed at 5 p.m., the doors were locked. You might have seen pictures of people trying to exercise their right to vote. The parking lot there was half a mile away. People had to park, rush if they had to go to work and try to, try to exercise their right to vote. It was terrible and undemocratic. We have situations in places where the unrest um, in the wake of uh, shooting another unarmed man at the, the, the hands of police in Wisconsin, which is a battleground state. We have a situation where in 2016, some 700,000 people were removed from voting rolls, majority people of color, majority women of color. We have a situation where um, uh, uh, the voting voter suppression where people are removed from the voting rolls and the fact that um, uh, the, the Republicans are spending more than $20 million uh, hiring what they're calling poll watchers, which are which could look like that 17-year-old armed guy uh, who shot and killed someone yesterday during the protest. I mean, I'm saying that the 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 stakes are so high that the unfinished business of the suffragette movement, which was inherently multiracial from the beginning, is to get right with racial justice. That to unite women across race in a country that's soon becoming a majority people of color, where there isn't a majority, like there isn't a majority any one group, we're, we're multiracial, our democracy can only be justice focused, where justice can be the law of the land, if we are able to uh, continue to expand the franchise by defending the vote of people, um, of, of, of women, of women of color who are the most likely to be targeted for uh, voter suppression. I mean, th this year, this year uh, is such a critical year. But what we see is unless we have significant changes, many of which the League of Women Voters has been backing for a long time, but unless we see significant long-term changes, things like automatic voter registration, like we have in California, but across the country, things like pre-registration of 17-year-olds, of um, everyone receiving a paper ballot, having uh, transparent tracking systems. Um, if we, we have um, uh, other ways of ensuring that every person's vote is counted. And I think that's where our movement, it's a, it's a, it's a natural progression of the suffragette movement, the struggle and fight for justice. And it was never just about being a woman, inherently just being a woman. It was about what we want to do with our vote. And the, the amazing potential of this moment for women of color who have stepped into view for the rest of the country, we are recognized as a powerhouse constituency. I heard Senator Kamala Harris, her name um, mentioned many times in this, uh, in, in this event for good reason, because she is an affirmation that women of color have now the space in our political culture in order to lead, because we don't just want to be the voters, we want uh, uh, to be a partner in governance. And I think that's where um, our work and lifting up the significance and telling the story, retelling the story of the passage of the 19th Amendment and putting Black women and women of color into our understanding, both of, uh, of the potential, the struggle, 
and the limitations of solutions and what we have to do today. I think that is ultimately where um, She the People's focus is going to be, is elevating those who will um, protect and expand uh, our right to vote and also what leaders look like now. And in 2018, we saw that women of color's um, uh, turnout, uh, despite 2016 being um, a year where even amongst the highest turnout group, which is black women nationally and also in California, it was back down to average. We saw in 2018, those trends reversed. So that women of color across the board's turnout increased 37%. Our goal for 2020 is to have historic turnout amongst uh, women of color who are holding down the most critical and transformative justice issues, economic justice, gender justice, and uh, racial justice. And for us to build a multiracial, truly powerful women's movement, we have to organize ourselves and be able to speak the language of solidarity from here on out. There cannot be a women, uh, cannot be like a gender focused uh, women's movement that does not take into its center race, because that's what corrupted our advancement to justice a hundred years ago. And that's the unfinished business that we can deal, um, deal with um, today. So I am uh, so beyond thrilled. She the people took a leadership role in very early on this year, um, making the case for a woman of color VP. And then we, uh, we polled uh, a national or national groups. We had listening sessions of women of color. We met with the Biden campaign and we uh, worked with the uh, media outlets to tell the story of how this would motivate um, and inspire a group of voters who have never really seen ourselves ever uh, there. So it was historic. But we also don't want to stop there. It's, it's never, a democracy is never really about one person or one candidate. You know, it's about all of us. And so we want to see women of color who are the le you know, least represented uh, in every level of government. Uh, we want to see women of color elected um, in historic numbers, uh, dwarfing 2018 numbers. And we know that it's possible because an historic number of women who of color are running for Senate, Congress, and down ballot. So um, that is that is my uh, that is where I'm at. Uh, that is where I feel optimism despite the present difficulties, and just so very glad to to be with you here today. Amy, thank you so much. It is so inspiring to hear about the work that She the People is doing. And, um, and as I was listening to you and I was listening to Supervisor Chan um, talking about really the grassroots organizing efforts, um, especially from diverse communities, both in the past, I, I really am inspired to sort of think back to the women, um, as you said, 100 years ago, even 200 years ago, 250 years ago, who, despite the fact that you are absolutely right, they were not welcomed necessarily by white women in the suffrage movement, but nevertheless, despite um, those kinds of barriers that they faced, they organized anyway, because they recognized the sort of fundamental truth that voting is power. And without the vote, you do not have the power um, that you need to make the kinds of changes in the society that you need for the benefit of your community, um, for the benefit of your children and your future. Um, and um, you had mentioned um, Ida B. Wells, who um, was president of the Alpha Suffrage Club in Illinois. And the Alpha Suffrage Club was really instrumental in pushing Illinois to grant equal suffrage rights to women in 1913, six years before the 19th Amendment. Um, and Wells herself was very well aware that she was building on the activism of a century of um, Black women uh, who came before her, um, starting with uh, Mariah Stewart, who um, in the 1820s um, stood up in a public audience to speak for women's rights and for the abolition of slavery, um, and continuing on through a really powerful generation of women um, around the civil rights era that I think most people are, sorry, the Civil War era that I think most people don't know too much about. And just in case anyone wants to read more, a couple of names are Mary Shad Carey, who was one of the first black women in the United States to become a lawyer. And she actually testified before Congress on civil rights issues 
um, in the 1860s and the 1870s. Um, another, and she was, she was sort of central in organizing um, the, the women's uh, rights campaigns after um, the 15th Amendment. Another important organizer from the period was a woman by the name of Naomi Anderson, um, who came to California and was very active in the um, 1896 California campaign, including speaking here in San Francisco and in Oakland pretty extensively. So there's a very long history of African American women in the suffrage movement. Um, particularly in the West, um, in the American West, there's extensive suffrage activism on the part of many Latina women as well. In California, in the 19, uh, 1911 successful um, suffrage campaign, Maria de Lopez was president of the College Equal Suffrage Association in Cal Southern California, which was really the organization that was sort of instrumental in helping to get the vote out and um, to get the amendment passed. Um, in states such as Colorado and New Mexico, which also had significant um, Latinx populations, women leaders there were very important also in getting suffrage passed and in getting the 19th Amendment ratified. Um, and I also just want to um, give a, uh, recognize the really it's significant and important role of indigenous women in the suffrage movement as well. Um, so one of the first um, elected officials in the United States, I think most people don't know this, was an indigenous woman um, by the name of Helen Clark, who was elected superintendent of schools in Montana in 1882. Um, and she had connections to the Montana suffrage movement um, all the way through through 1914. Um, and there were many indigenous women who worked for suffrage as well. Um, but um, when the 19th Amendment was passed, most of those women were not enfranchised by the 19th Amendment because indigenous people were not considered to be citizens until the passage of the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act. And women's activism, again, particularly a Lakota activist by the name of Zikala Sa, were critical in getting that law passed. But as um, several folks have mentioned, um, even with the passage of the 19th Amendment and other laws such as the 1924 Citizenship Act, the Indian Citizenship Act, many women had the right to vote on paper, but they did not have it in practice because there were many voter suppression tactics that were used to disenfranchise women, um, uh, from, particularly from um, in the West, uh, many Latina women, many um, indigenous women, and in the South, of course, um, Jim Crow laws, which uh, prevented black women from exercising their franchise. And in fact, those voter suppression tactics in many parts of the country actually got worse after the passage of the 19th Amendment because you had a new constituency of people who were trying to exercise their right to vote. And so the reaction to that was the passage of even more voter suppression measures. And, um, you know, as folks have highlighted, voter suppression is something that we need to keep our eye on. Um, today, as a, as a historian of suffrage, I can tell you that there have been many times in American history when suffrage has been granted, but it has also been taken away. And so the fact that you have a right does not necessarily mean that you're going to keep that right and that you're going to continue to be able to exercise that right. And so I will leave everyone with that thought. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we are going to move on to our final speaker tonight, and um, she is one of the people who helped make this happen. Allison Goh is the current president of the League of Women Voters of San Francisco. Previously, she served as VP of Voter Services and Pros and Cons Guide Chair. Allison's passionate about voter education, voting rights, and women's representation in elected offices, and has had a career dedicated to political campaigns and social justice issues. Allison, thank you for having us all here tonight and for all the work you and uh, the League is doing. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, it wasn't all just a single woman effort. There were a number of other women um, in the League that definitely pitched in. I want to thank our volunteer coordinator, Kathy Barr, for really pitching in and helping uh, put this together. It's been really inspiring for me to hear from some of our felt my fellow panelists who came before me, uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Congresswoman Spear, Supervisor Chan, Amy Allison, just really amazing for me to hear all these your stories and just really thank you for your leadership. Um, so like Marissa just said, I'm Allison. I'm the president of the League of Women Vo Voters of San Francisco. Uh, we are a nonpartisan volunteer run organization and we're focused on nonpartisan voter education and advocacy efforts in San Francisco. So my little personal story, uh, my family immigrated to the United States when I was three years old. Uh, we moved from Singapore to the Chicago suburbs in the middle of February, which is when we experienced our first snowstorm followed by a tornado that spring. And this is probably why we eventually settled in the Bay Area. 
Um, I remember the first time my parents voted, they were really proud to cast their ballots in the 2000 presidential election. And they voted in every single election ever since. Um, my mother basically raised me listening to whatever our local NPR station was, wherever we lived, uh, reading the newspapers and discussing politics over the dinner table. And she's the real reason why I'm excited to be part of this event today and talk to you all. And hi, mom. <laughs> So at the start of this event, Kimberly described today's event as the commemoration of a 72-year-old struck 72-year struggle from Seneca Falls to the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And I really think it's a good description for a suffrage celebration because as we've been discussing, it's really important that we remember that not all women got the right to vote 100 years ago. Um, as we've been saying, women of color were still fighting for their right to vote long after 1920. Many black women, native women that we've named, Asian American women would be denied citizenship and the right to vote for decades to come. And of course, as we know, women were absolutely influential in the civil rights movements of the 1960s. And today we're still fighting a lot of the same fight. Uh, we're protecting the right to vote when it's challenged, whether it be the closing of polling locations, restrictive voter ID laws, or gerrymandered districts. And there's a real reason why women's rights and racial justice efforts have long been intertwined, going back to the strong connections between women's suffrage and abolition movements. As Franny Lou Framer once told the National Women's Political Caucus, nobody's free until everybody's free. And like many others here, I'm sure many in the audience, I've been inspired by this centennial celebration to read more about the fight for suffrage 100 years ago. And honestly, what stood out to me the most are the women that history textbooks have overlooked. Um, the black and brown women, the queer and lesbian women, the native women, all of whom played a role in the passage of the 19th Amendment, um, even though they found themselves excluded from the rights for which they fought. I read about Bertha Pitts Campbell, who led her sorority in the 1913 suffrage parade in Washington, DC. But they were relegated to the segregated section, to the back of the parade were the queer women who held leadership positions in the suffrage movement, like Alice Dunbar Nelson, and Carrie Chapman Catt, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, who at the time, they may have had no name for their partners or relationships, but they were no less fierce fighters for voting equality. And I know, like, I'm with the League of Women Voters, and I know what some people think when they think of the League, and I usually get the response, well, my grandmother was a member. <laughs> And uh, we're not sitting around someone's living room drinking tea, although we do like to sitting in living rooms drinking tea. Um, we're gathering, we're gathering on Zoom calls or Facebook groups, we're talking on Twitter to discuss issues that are important to us as women and an engaged citizenry. So right now we may not be marching in the streets wearing suffragette white, but we are participating in socially distanced rallies and maybe write, writing postcards to voters. Um, in this League of Women Voters, we're carrying on the same fight a hundred years later. Our League of Women Voters, we're modern, we're multi-generational, we're diverse. Um, over half of our board members identify as queer or a person of color. Uh, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion policy that guides our work committed to a fully inclusive organization. And if you think I'm a young president of the League, our, our last president, she hasn't even and turned 30 yet, and she was recently elected to the National League of Women Voters Board. So people come to us all the time and they say, how do I get involved? And there's the old saying that all, all politics is local, and that's because it is. It really begins in our home, in our block, or in our neighborhood. And at the League of Women Voters here, we focus on San Francisco issues and races. Next month, we'll be hosting several candidate forums for the Board of Supervisors races specifically in districts one, seven, and 11. Every election, we also produce a voting, a nonpartisan voting guide. It's called our pros and cons guide. Um, and our volunteers <laughs> research and write summaries of all of our ballot measures, explaining the pros and cons of each one in an easy to understand nonpartisan manner. And I, I can speaking on behalf of our volunteers and as a former chair of this, this product, uh, thank goodness we only have 12. Um, also, our advocacy team makes ballot recommendations every election. You can look out for those on our website. And our team of volunteers makes recommendations off of existing league positions and studies. And these positions and studies, mind you, are extremely thorough and in no way rushed to be put together. And they read these and the materials about the ballot measures and make our informed ballot recommendations for each election. 
So I mentioned a lot of things. If you like to find this voting information or check your registration, your address, if you've had a name change or maybe you've moved, you can go to our uh, brand new page at lwvsf.org vote. We're gonna keep it updated through the fall as we release new materials such as the candidate form recordings, uh, videotaped ballot discussions and video statements from the candidates. Our league also registers voters and we usually find ourselves at street fairs or office cafeterias during lunch or maybe even your neighborhood bar. Um, and this year we're still continuing that work just online. We're gonna be having Ask the League hours over Zoom where community members can come ask um, questions about how to turn in their ballots, assist with registering uh, how to vote. Um, we'll also be working with colleges and universities to engage and register students. We're working with UCSF and USF to provide nonpartisan education for their students, faculty, and community. Um, in addition to that, we're working with UCSF to provide voter registration information, vote by mail assistant, and educational materials in their clinics and their doctor's offices so that people can make a plan to vote safely. We're also voting, we're also working with the ACLU and Let Me Vote to help those who are in jail have access to voting. Um, another thing we do is we have the League Observer Corps. Uh, we started this program. Uh, to change a couple of years ago, actually, to train community members like yourself to observe government meetings uh, with a focus on police and district, police district and police oversight commission meetings, ensuring government transparency and accountability. So we're an entirely volunteer run organization. We have volunteer opportunities of all sizes. If you're interested in joining us, looking at all of our volunteer materials, um, or just want to see some of our, our educational materials for the fall, we're at lwvsf.org. Uh, we're also very active on Twitter or on Facebook. And so let's continue this fight for voting equality in the next 10, ten year, sorry, 100 years. Uh, thank you for having me this evening. Um, and it's, it's been really a pleasure hearing from everybody. Okay, so um, I, this is, I see that a lot of people have been uh, putting in some questions into the chat room. Um, I think I will, uh, I'm Pam Troy, I'm the events assistant here, and I will uh, take a few questions and answer them if you'd like. Um, one of the questions that was asked, um, and I think that, uh, Alice, that Allison might have just covered it, but it's basically about from Sally Whitehead, and it's um, how really can regular folks help out this year to make sure people can get to the polls or submit their mail-in ballots properly on time to the right place, mailbox or other options. Um, this aside from being a poll worker, what um, are there other orga um, or uh, volunteer organizations that you know of that are working on this? Pam, should I just jump in? Sure, absolutely. Okay. I appreciate the question. Um, for those of us who, who live in California, often we have this calculus about, oh, California is gonna vote a particular way, we're not gonna really be uh, the, the difference maker in the, in the Senate and the White House race. And, um, but I do think there is some concrete things that we should plan to do as Bay Area women, as California women. Um, one is that, um, the When We All Vote organization, uh, She the People is partnering with. It's Michelle Obama, Valerie Jarrett's head of the board. It has deep ties to the, the Obama era White House Office on Women of, and Girls. Uh, you can trust that there's a focus on women of color and there's a focus on, you know, just getting everybody the right to vote. And they have um, incredible resources. And so if you go to um, uh, When We All Vote, that's one way. Um, to make sure that uh, you have the resources for your friends and family to be registered. And second, I want to encourage you to go directly to the groups who are led by women of color on the ground in some of the states. So you might say, well, okay, we have work to do in California, and I respect that. However, if you are interested in um, uh, verifying registration and talking to voters in Arizona, the organization is One Arizona. I'll put, these, I'll put the addresses. In Texas, 
where 26% of the electorate is women of color, have Latino and Black uh, women who are typically ignored by both parties. Uh, the group the Texas Organizing Project is, is taking out-of-state volunteers. Sometimes people would go and just like do a caravan. That's not going to happen because a lot of the organizers aren't going door to door. But what I can say is there's organizing New Georgia Project run by Inse Ufan, a black woman in Georgia, as well as uh, Andrea Mercado uh, and Florida New Majority. Every single one of these groups has a way for volunteers to call, uh, to text voters and, and uh, eligible voters to make sure that we take them uh, through the registration process and make sure they're on the voter rolls. That's what I would do. And I'll put the links in here because I think that's the most impactful way for us to spend our time and effort over the next 69 days. And uh, one more question, and this is from uh, Judith Kahn. Do you think voter suppression efforts will be effective in November? Do you think that they're, they pose very serious, I mean, a serious danger to, um, to having a fair election? How, how optimistic is everybody about these, about how far the current administration will go? Or pessimistic? Um, so, hi, this is Jennifer. So, um, you know, I, I talk about history, not necessarily about the present. But I think I would just like to remind everybody that voter suppression has a long and very successful history in the United States. Um, and part of that um, is because we do not have a constitutionally guaranteed right to vote, okay? Amendments such as the 19th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, they prohibit discrimination on the basis of, you know, race and sex, but that's all they do. They don't do, they don't have a positive, affirmative um, protection for the right to vote. And so I think that, um, you know, there are, because of that, um, states are free to pass laws on all kinds of criteria that may not look like racial or gender discrimination that have that impact. And there's a very long and, as I said, successful history of doing that in the United States. And um, once one sort of pathway to that gets shut down, another way, you know, revs up. And I think that looking at Florida is a good example, right? So in Florida, you had a bill or you had a referendum which um, enfranchised um, people who had been incarcerated and then so then another law comes along which says well okay you can't vote until you pay your fines and so there's this kind of constant back and forth um, and as I said if you look at sort of the history around voting rights there's this kind of constant struggle uh, between the folks who want to expand them and folks who want to keep them constricted and that's just a very real part of our history. So I can't really, I'm not an expert in what's gonna happen in 2020, but this is a very real part of, of who we are as a nation. And it's something that, you know, we need to sort of constantly be grappling with, I think. Uh, and, and I'll just add to what Jennifer said and say that, look, um, we know uh, voter suppression is going to be the main way um, that the Republicans are, are really seeing a path to victory and messing with the post office is one of those, but there's a lot of others that we saw at play during the primaries. Really astronomical long lines in Texas Southern and in Houston. Eight hours for the for one the person who last person to vote and to expect regular people to stand in line that long is is part of that. Um, so we know that here here's the thing I want to tell you as uh, a voting day for us is not November 3rd. Voting day has to start earlier so we can get make sure everybody gets their vote in and gets it counted. So a lot of us are aiming toward uh, October 15th and then having the last two weeks be get out the vote, you know, get their family, friends, trusted, trusted community out to uh, cast their ballot. Most ballots, we believe, will be cast in person, which means really, really long, uh, long lines. And uh, we need people to vote early. I, th I think the other thing we should just get our minds wrapped around is I, we do not believe that the election will be called on November 3rd. There's a lot of pressure from the uh, networks and from media to call it, but we think there are gonna be millions and millions of votes yet to be counted that will determine the results um, even, even weeks after the third. So because of this, it's important for organizations to stay strong and make sure that we take the time 
to make sure everyone's vote is counted and we don't succumb to the pressure of just calling it. Um, not, not this year, not with all the voter suppression that's happening. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap up now. So I want to thank uh, Amy Allison and Allison Go and our other incredibly inspiring guests tonight, Congresswoman Jackie Spear, Lieutenant Governor Eleni Kunalakis, and Alameda County Supervisor Wilma Chan, and of course our moderator for the evening, um, Marissa Lagos. And also want to thank our our colleagues and our friends at the League of Women Voters, particularly Kathy Barr and her entire staff, and remind everyone, please get out and vote. And thank you for joining us on the 100th anniversary of suffrage. We hope that you'll join us again soon at Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and good night. <laughs>